author opinion of Dennis Keane at the history, geography and architecture, culture and life manners of Kazakhs in the program Discovering Kazakhstan. In today's program, shamanic spells at the Folk Instrument Museum, playing the pipes at the National Conservatory, Kazakh grandmothers go a cappella. Salam, Prijet, and hello. I'm Dennis Keen, and today on Discovering Kazakhstan, we will be discovering the world of Kazakh music in the country's cultural capital of Almaty. If you're a music lover coming to Kazakhstan, then Almaty is the place to be. It's got music museums, musical theaters, opera, ballet, folk music. No matter what you're looking for, it's here. There's a lot to see, so come along as we explore Kazakhstan's musical mecca. Passing by the last row of oak trees at the edge of Almaty's Panfilov Park, you come across the most spectacular building covered in carved wood. It was built during the Tsarist era as a meeting house for military officers, but these days it is the National Folk Instrument Museum. And in case you needed a clue to its use these days, you have one of the most famous of all Cossack folk instruments out here in front, the Kolbuz. Considered to be the ancient ancestor of the cello, the kolbuz was a bowed instrument strung with horsehair, and it was traditionally associated with shamans who would play it to transport themselves to the spirit world. That's why here we have these chimes and triangles made of glass, which would be used to fend off evil spirits. What we'll see inside the museum is that almost every folk instrument has its own story, its own legend, and it's a joy to discover. Hello. Hello. Jean Saya is the best guide here at the Folk Music Instrument Museum. She's gonna be showing us around a little bit. And we've met here in this beautiful foyer to the museum, which is a work of art on its own. So is this museum as ancient as it seems? These carvings look like they could have come from the Silk Road. The museum was opened in 1981, but we decorated our museum five years ago. You guys really did an amazing job. And if I remember correctly, on the inside of the museum where I have spent a lot of time, there is so much to see, so much to explore. So I think we better get going. Yes, we have a lot of very interesting and beautiful things inside. Let's go. Okay. This is our first hall, introductory hall. Here you will meet with the classification of Kazakh national musical instruments. Our instruments are divided into several groups. Okay. Noise making instruments, percussion instruments, boat instruments, wind instruments, flat instruments and reed instruments. I like this idea of noise making instrument. You don't want to make any music, you just want to make a bunch of noise. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that's what this is for, yes, right? This one is noise making instrument. The name okay. of this instrument is Asatayak. So in this case, uh, you know, why were they making a bunch of noise? I think this was an instrument for shamans, right? Yes, you are right. Because before in Islam, uh, in our territory was shamanism. Right. So they could take this little stick here, uh, move it up and down, and all these metal pieces that will jingle together and maybe scare away some kind of bad spirits. Okay, so that's the noise making. Yes. Here we have percussion. Percussion instrument. The name of this instrument is double. It was made from the camel's leather and the wood. Earlier, this instrument was used in military campaigns to signal about coming of enemies or just to scar the enemies. Okay, camel leather drum. Now that's something special for Kazakhstan. So this instrument is Kobus, it's boat instrument, was made from the wood, leather, and the horse tail. It was funny because though we saw one outside and we talked about how originally it was made out of horse hair, but here it says wood, leather, metal, bone, fishing line. So I guess w when modern nomads no longer had horses to take the hair, you can use the line from a fishing pole. Yes, earlier masters used horse tails, but yeah. nowadays they use a fishing line sometimes. Okay, is the sound the same? Uh, a bit different. It's a bit different, yeah. And now look at this huge horn 
we have here. What's this called? Uh, the name of this instrument is Kirni. Okay. It's a wind instrument, was made from the wood. And earlier this instrument also was used in military campaigns and sometime in hunting. Okay, and what is this little leather thing hanging down there with some hair? Uh, it's just a decoration. Some decoration? Yes. Okay. And uh, this is our main instrument. Uh, the name of this instrument is Dombra. Dombra is a two-string plucked instrument. This Dombra was made from the wood, strings are from the animal's gut and decorated with bones. So right away I have found my favorite instrument of all those five that you classified, and that is the reed instrument, the Sean Colbuz, the juice harp. It's just such an unusual instrument, and what I like is that it can really be played by anybody. It can be played by little kids, by old people, by girls, by boys. Um, and so this is a kind of classic that you can find all around the world. But one version of the juice harp that you don't usually see is that guy there. This is wooden shankobus. This is ancient version of shankobus. Earlier musicians used this kind of shankobus. Then they start to use metallic shankobus. It makes sense because wood is a more accessible material. It's something that early Kazakhs maybe would have had access to and then only later they developed the art of metal working and of making yes. these kind of more advanced forms. And it also kind of works a little bit differently because it's got this long shape and it's got this little wooden tongue, as they call it, and it's got a string on there. Yeah. So you have to kind of pull the string and it makes that tongue fluctuate back and forth. And Looking at it, you could never imagine what kind of sounds could come out of a wooden stick, but it really is something to hear. Dennis, if you like unusual instruments, you definitely like this one. Yeah. <laughs> is that a bagpipe? Yeah, really? it's Kazakh version of bagpipe. It's Kazakh bagpipe. <laughs> yeah. Who would have thought that here, thousands of kilometers away from Scotland, you have a bagpipe? So what's this doing here? The name of this instrument is Gilboise. It was made from the goat leather and reed. It's also a wind instrument. Wow, and it looks ancient. I mean, it looks like it's been sitting here drying up for decades. I can't imagine like what it must sound to play one of them. Have you heard it before? Uh, no, uh, there, there is a few information about this instrument, yeah. but nowadays we don't use this instrument. So this is a whole of Dombra. I said that Dombra is the main instrument of Kazakh nation. And one Kazakh poet said that the real Kazakh isn't Kazakh, the real Kazakh is Dombra. That is the real one right there. So as you notice, there are a lot of shapes of yeah, Dombra. Yeah, quite a variety. Yes, but they are ancient shapes. Nowadays, we have two main shapes of this instrument. This is oval-shaped Dombra. Basically, this instrument is used to produce a key. Key, okay. it's a composition without any words, just a melody, just the music of this instrument. And this shape, it's square-shaped dombra. It's used to accompany songs. With singing? Yes. Right. So maybe the pear-shaped instrument, it has to be more expressive, so it has a kind of richer sound, whereas this more angular instrument over here, it can have a sharper sound, and the emotion should be conveyed by the singer. Yes. Right. So two different kind of styles of dombra playing, but there it seems to me that there's not just two different kinds of dombras, there's a million different kinds. I mean, walking around this room, there's a dozen different shapes, a dozen different colors. Um, for one simple instrument with just two strings, you can really do a lot with it. These are modern types of Kazakh national musical instruments. I can see that they've kind of evolved over the years, right? So those were the most primitive. They're made from very kind of rough, old materials. And these are new and beautiful. Yeah, you're right. And there's this one, looks like a violin, Western musical instrument. Yeah. Right, right. And there's this one as bass guitar. So they've almost become more Western over, yeah. over the years too. You are right. And uh, these are modern types of khubus. Nowadays, musicians use these kinds of khubus yeah. on the stage. And this is bass dombra. It's used in orchestras. So in a big orchestra, right, you need a variety of sounds. And so they need a bass sound as much as they need a kind of tenor dombra. Um, now, of course, before, Kazakhs never used to play in orchestras, right? They used to have maybe just one guy with a dombra playing it, singing yeah, a song. Right. But 
you know, it's the modern age, people want to hear some big ensemble of musicians. So that's why we have all these kind of evolved models of these traditional instruments to make new, beautiful, interesting sounds. If the Music Museum leaves you madly in love with folk instruments, there are workshops in Almaty where you can see a dombra made by hand before your very eyes. In a precise process that's been passed down for generations, pieces of wood are treated, carved into graceful shapes, and delicately glued together. Compared to another wooden instrument like an acoustic guitar, the final instrument is lightweight and minimal in design. What makes each instrument unique are the beautiful Kazakh patterns imprinted on each one. Ram's horns, swan's necks, petals, and leaves make a musical instrument into a canvas for these talented artists. Musicians were held in such high esteem in the Soviet Union that they were given special apartments by the state which nowadays we can visit because they've been turned into what are called home museums. Today we're going to a special apartment building called the House of Culture Workers. On the outside, it's covered in commemorative plaques saying which famous creators once lived here. We are going to the former home of the King of Kazakh Conductors, Nurgiza Tilendiev. It is a tradition in these kinds of home museums in Almaty to put on these plastic booties so that you can keep everything as pristine as possible. The idea is to make the place feel as if it were frozen in time. And indeed, that's the impression that you get when you walk in the apartment. It's as if the late composer Taliyev could come home at any minute. Here at his coat rack, his leather jacket and his hat are still hanging up and here in the corner are the canes that he used as an old man, very, very charmingly carved with different figures on them. What immediately strikes me about the apartment is just how big it is. Soviet apartments were notorious for being about as spacious as a sardine can, but it seems like during the Soviet Union, successful artists were really spoiled by the system. Here we have a big dining room, there's a little studio off to the side, an open kitchen, and this is just the part of the apartment for entertaining. Over on the other side, where the museum now has offices, are several bedrooms. What makes the House of Culture Workers one of the most legendary apartment buildings in Almaty is that every artist were given their own studio where they had the space and solitude to compose the next great Soviet masterpiece. These studios are interesting for us nowadays because they contain musical artifacts. Here, for example, we can see the Dombra, where Tlenliev would have once strummed Kazakh folk tunes, and here, the piano, where he might have composed some of his greatest works. Elsewhere in the studio, we can find behind glass Tlendiev's most prized personal possessions, his pocket watches and his eyeglasses, the medals that he would have once worn from the coat of his jacket, his membership cards for the Soviet Union's Union of Composers, and the composer's baton, which he became famous for wielding. We can see the tuxedo, which he would have once worn to his performances, and on this sheet music written in blue pen, the melodies of Tlendiev that became famous throughout Kazakhstan. One thing that's fun about exploring these home museums is going through all the quirky gifts that the people received throughout their lifetime now on proud display. Here we can mostly see various tchotchkes that the musician would have placed on top of his piano, but there's one gift that really stands out. A portrait from the Todi Korgan sugar factory of the artist made entirely out of sweet white sugar crystals. 
I snoopily opened the door to what I thought must be a closet and found what must be the coolest room in the house, what we would call in America, Tendiev's man cave. Here we have some of the same things you might find back home, like the hunting rifle and the antlers from some hunting conquest. But then we also have some things that are a little bit more Kazakh. The elaborate carpets on the wall, or the low table where he would have sat with his buddies to play a game of chess. Back home in the US, if you have a passion for music, your study is usually self-driven. You're noodling on your guitar in your bedroom, or maybe a piano teacher might come over and run through some drills with you. But in Kazakhstan, there is a whole system of musical education. From a young age, kids go to specially dedicated musical schools. And if they have enough talent, they'll move on to musical colleges or conservatories. The National Conservatory of Kazakhstan is in Almaty, and some of the greatest musical minds of Kazakhstan have passed through these halls. The National Academy has its very own concert hall outside of which you'll find a statue to Kurman Ghazi, quite probably the most famous composer of all time for the Dombra. Kurman Ghazi in particular is known for his instrumental pieces, what Kazakhs call ki. We've come to the concert hall to get a behind the scenes look at Kazakh orchestral music. The student orchestra of the National Academy is rehearsing for an upcoming concert and we get a sneak peek. It's a small theater to begin with, an intimate space for only 500 people, but to be the only one in here seeing this amazingly talented group of young musicians is really a privilege. We can see that the orchestra is actually much like a Western orchestra, but the Western instruments have been switched out for Kazakh ones. So here you notice that a lot of the rhythm is actually supplied by the dombra, that two-stringed lute. It has this very kind of thin sound that provides this beating drive. We also see that instead of the violins, we have this almost a violinified kobuz. That was that horse-haired fiddle that we saw in the museum. And we saw some of the more contemporary versions how over time, especially in the 1940s, they started to develop a more Western variant. And we can see that here on the right side. That's what's called the Kolbas Prima. But look straight down the middle and you can see those older fashioned Kolbas still with that leather element. And the sound is quite different as well. While this one in the middle has this primal, almost screaming uh, effect, the one on the right is much more classical and subtle. Once I was on a stroll through Almaty, walking by the conservatory, and I was struck by that characteristic boom of an organ. And I did a double take. You wouldn't expect to find an organ here. You know, you, you associate them with big Catholic cathedrals, but in such a modest theater like this in Kazakhstan, I never expected to come across one. But in fact, this is just one of many organs in the country. It is the oldest, built in 1967, now celebrating its 50 year birthday. There is a whole organ department at the National Academy, and we are gonna be so lucky to sit in on one of these organ classes with the organ teacher himself, Gabit Nasibayev. 
Это кто-то расшил его. И э, уже так, знаешь, очень коряво, и по ним играть невозможно. Здравствуйте. Hello. Hello. Dennis. Gabi. Nice to meet you. Me too. So I'm really excited to see uh, what you can do with this organ. I've never played an organ. I've never been this close to an organ. I've only heard it in churches. Anyway, you can try. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I'm a little bit scared. I, 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 I'll show you everything. Okay. St step by step. Okay. Yeah. But first, you have to sit as I a bench. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing that's unusual about an organ is that you also have to play it with your feet. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but it's not so complicated like, okay. it, like it seems. Yeah. Know? Really. Indeed. And you must prefer at first a keyboard. Which one you prefer? The main keyboard or the second upper keyboard? What's the difference? A lot of difference because each keyboard is a, a, like a, a small orchestra okay. with own voices, with own timbres and everything. Pull it. This one of the stops of the uh, main menu. Okay. Great or and try and another one. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> All right, I did it. Oh. But, but but what does this do? It means I have to pull this before I. Play yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. it's a uh, stop, one of the stop. Okay. Uh, we have uh, 32 stops on our organ, and uh, this is uh, one of the stops. And uh, you can uh, try the pedal keyboard too. Okay. But at first, you, you must have to pull. You have to pull the stop. Uh, yeah. I'm getting the hang of this already. So which one should I pull? This one here. I, I like recommend it. this one and this. <laughs> okay. Both together. Both of them together. Yeah. Like this? And try it. Yeah. Oh, I like that. And I noticed that here it's written in German. Yeah. Because this is a German machine, actually. Yeah. Okay. It's a beautiful uh, work of art, but to be honest, Gabi, I think I better give you the bench and see what you can do with it. Uh, as you see, we have a, a class now. And we do. It seems to me it will be better if one of the students... How long have they been studying with you? These two girls finished the first uh, year of studying. Okay. And this girl mm -hmm. is class, and this guy is continuing the second year. And here you can see uh, two ladies. There are organ teachers, my colleagues. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Young teachers. Yeah. yeah. But you're quite a veteran. How long have you been teaching here now already? About 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing what they can do. Let's give them the seat. Yeah. yeah. Leila, go on. Bravo. Well, I've made a kind of small special request because what we've been hearing so far sounds kind of like your classical uh, European organ music, and I was curious whether there's some kind of Kazakh melody that you can play on the organ. So Golza Dahir is going to play a composition called Voice of Asia, which was actually made for a wind instrument, but we're going to see what she can do on the organ.
walking through the hallways of the conservatory is always something of a chaotic experience. As you pass from classroom to classroom, you'll pick up snippets of song here and there, it all adding up into this cacophony. These are double doors, so we can open it up and hear just a little bit of sound coming out of there. They're practicing a piano piece in there. At the school, they have both Western instruments and folk instruments. And Almata does have an opera house, so I'm not surprised to hear an opera diva belting out some tunes behind this door. Let's have a look. After finishing their education at the conservatory, opera singers like this one can go on to join the company of the city's opera house. The Abai Theater of Opera and Ballet is an Almaty landmark located in the city's historic center. We missed out on seeing an opera, but what we got to see was even better, a performance of a classic Russian ballet, The Fountain of Bakhti Sarai. The ballet tells the story of love and drama at the harem of a Tatar sultan. Tatars are a Muslim people who speak a similar Turkic language to Kazakhs. So this story from a neighboring nation has some resonance with local people. The music from the Soviet composer Boris Asafiev also feels familiar, playfully incorporating the aesthetics of Turkic folk music. The result is a musical experience unlike any other I've ever seen. A mix of Soviet and Central Asian influences, dressed up in tights and performed on point. On our journey through Kazakh folk music, we've heard so much beautiful instrumental music, but at the heart of the Kazakh folk tradition is vocal music. That's why today we're meeting with an amazing choir called Elipe Analar, these eight beautiful grannies who are going to be singing a special song for us called Ush Kongur. This is the name of the president's hometown, and the text of the song was actually written by the president himself. So let's give it a listen. Kazakh choirs are often accompanied by accordions, but this is something of a Soviet innovation. Traditionally, Kazakh singing would have been accompanied by a Kazakh folk instrument, like the dombra. So here we have a more traditional setting. Our grannies are dressed up in their beautiful scarves called kimishek, these turbans called kunduz, and they're going to smile and sing for us a traditional song, a kind of potpourri of different folk melodies. <laughs> Yeah. 
Oh. <laughs> well, you can't help but smile listening to this joyous Kazakh music. And I hope that today on Discovering Kazakhstan, we put a smile on your face as well. Until next time, salbo, baka, and goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.